Today is a pretty sad day for, for Stat 110 because I just saw in the, in the news that, that a, a, a judge in the, in the UK has, has, has ruled against the use of, of Bayes rule in, in court. Uh, so, at least it was, not, it was not in the US, but it was in the U UK. Uh, I, I posted the link on, on Twitter. Uh, uh, that's a very disturbing case. I haven't read the full legal ruling yet, uh, but, I, but I intend to. Um, but my impression is that, is that the judge kind of didn't like, maybe the judge, I haven't, you know, haven't seen all the details of the case, so, so maybe the judge had a valid point of like, kind of the, the so-called expert witness was just kind of like, estimating some probabilities and then throwing them into Bayes' rule. And as with anything else, it, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you put in garbage probabilities in Bayes' rule, you'll get garbage out. But sounds like he wrote the uh, opinion in, in this case in, in a kind of sweeping way that, that, that others could use as a, as a precedent against using Bayes' rule. So um, normally I don't want to, in, you know, inject uh, politics in this class, especially not uh, British politics, but I, I, I strongly oppose that, that, and I think that that should be overturned. So if any of you have any connections in the British government or anything, maybe we can do something about that. Um, so sorry I had to bring you that, that bad news, but at least it's not a, a US case. Uh, so, so to cheer us up, let, let's talk more about universality of the uniform. Um, so we were doing that at the end last time. I proved the theorem, but I did not do an example yet, and it probably looked a little bit mysterious last time. I mean, the, the math is perfectly correct, and you could, you could review what we did last time, and hopefully you can follow every step, and, and if you were confused by the proof, you, you should review that. But, you know, it's a proof, so you, you can't argue with it, but that doesn't explain what does it really mean, okay? So I want to talk a little bit more about universality and a couple of other odds and ends, and then we'll get to the, the normal distribution, which is the other key continuous distribution that, that we need at least before the midterm. So just to re remind you of, of the statement, uh, universality of the uniform, we proved it last time. I'll just remind you quickly what it said. It said, well, that let capital F be a continuous, strictly increasing CDF. So this is a little bit unusual compared with what we're used to because we've mostly been starting with a random variable then find the CDF. But, but we did talk about the fact that any function that's right continuous and increasing and goes to zero if you go to the left to minus infinity and goes to one as you go to the right as you, as you go to infinity, that's a valid CDF. So here we're starting with the CDF, not starting with the random variable. And I strengthen just to, this result can be generalized, but, but to make it uh, easier to prove, I assumed it was continuous. Remember, in general, we just need right continuous. And I assumed it was strictly increasing. Just makes things nicer not having to deal with flat regions. But, you know, in general, a CDF could be flat and then increase, flat and then increase. I'm mean, just assuming it keeps increasing, increasing strict, strictly. Okay, that, that's the, those are the assumptions. And then the statement of the theorem is that if we let x equal f inverse of u, that's the definition of x. If we let x equal f inverse of, of u, that's, that's, that's going to have CDF f if u is uniform 0, 1. So this says, so that's the reason I call it universality. It says you just start with any uniform 0, 1 random variable, and at least in principle, we, we, can, we can synthetically create a random variable with any distribution we, we want. So we're interested in, in so this is, this is, this is in, useful for simulation, right? It's saying, well, if we're interested in simulating random draws from the distribution of F, one approach to doing that is, is get, get some uniforms, which are, well, typically it's, it's easier to generate uniforms than to generate uh, other distributions uh, in the continuous case, then compute F inverse of U, and, and then we're done. In practice, this, this, you know, in some cases, this is very easy. In, in many cases, it's going to be very hard to, to analytically write down this, this F inverse. But at least in principle, the, 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 this is saying from the uniform, you, you can get everything. So that, that, that's conceptually quite nice. <clears throat> um, this is also the fundamental reason why, remember we talked about these three properties of the CDF. But I didn't prove the fact that those three properties are enough to, to describe a CDF. 
and, and what the, you know, uh, if we extend this a, a little bit, it, it's saying that if we have any function f that satisfies the properties of a CDF, then it is a CDF. Okay, so I wanted to do an example and talk a little bit more about the, the intuition behind this. We proved it last time. Uh, there, there's kind of a flip side to this. So that, that's, you know, statement one. There's another way to, to write this, which is kind of going the other way around. Here we started with a uniform 0, 1. We computed f inverse of u, and we claim that that has CDF f. Okay? What if we went the other way around, and we, if we already had x? So if we start with x, and we don't have a uniform yet, we just have x, which has CDF capital F. And then, just, just to kind of get an idea of what's going on here, just apply f to both sides, it would say f of x equals u. So we're, go we're going in, in the opposite direction. If x is distributed according to f, then if you compute f of x, that's going to be distributed as uniform 0, 1. And this looks very mysterious to most people the first time they see this, okay? Because th there's, so there's something kind of beautifully and bizarrely self-referential about this. What, what did we do here? We took a random variable x and we plugged it into its own CDF. So that sounds like a kind of a strange thing to do, okay? But, but first make sure that it makes sense to you, what, what does that actually mean? What it means is simply, x is a random variable. We've talked before about the fact that a function of a random variable is a random variable. f is just, is just a function, so a function of a random variable is a random variable. So that's a perfectly valid random variable. That doesn't explain why we want to plug x into its own CDF, but we can do it if we want. That's a random variable. And the theorem says that that's actually going to be a uniform 0, 1. Notice, of course, because the CDF takes values between 0 and 1, we, we know that this is going to always take values between 0 and 1. That doesn't show it's uniform, but at least that, that, that shows that it's going from 0 to 1, which, which makes sense. So notice also that there's some notational difficulty that, that you could run into here that I just wanted to warn you about. Remember the CDF, f of x equals the probability that x is less than or equal to little x. So if you kind of just blindly plug in capital X here, you would get f of x equals the probability big X less than or equal to big X. But so big X less than or equal to big X, that's an event. But that's an event that always happens, right? I, you know, you don't need any kind of not insider information or to do anything to know that that's true. Big X is less than or equal to big X. You didn't have to tell me that. So that's actually one. Um, but that would say that f of capital X equals one, which is not what we're trying to say. So this, is, so this step is actually wrong. And it looked very natural to just plug in capital X, okay? So that's why you have to interpret this carefully. The interpretation is, is best seen th through an example. So let's suppose that f of x, f of little x equals 1 minus e to the minus little x. That's a little x here. It's just I'm writing big so that you can see. That's f of little x equals 1 minus e to the minus x uh, for x greater than 0. Uh, this is an important CDF called the exponential distribution that, that we'll get to later. If x, and then if x is negative, then um, then we set it equal to zero. So, so this, is, this is continuous, and it's strictly increasing on, on the positive side. It's just flat at zero on, on the negative side, but, but, the, but the, the same ar argument is going to work. Then the interpretation would be f of capital X equals 1 minus e to the minus capital X. Right? So that's very natural, right? I just changed little x to big X. Here we run into, this is the intended interpretation. So the interpretation of, of this expression is that we first evaluate the function f at, at, you know, as a function, you know, something squared or, or whatever. So write it as a function, then replace little x by big x, then we won't run into trouble. Here, here can, you know, r runs into just, it's just a notational uh, issue, but it can be confusing if you haven't thought it through carefully. All right, so, so this result kind of just looks like a curiosity at this point, but the reason I'm talking about it is, first of all, it's, it's just good practice with thinking about the difference between a random variable and its distribution. 
just, you know, just to take the effort to understand what this really means is worthwhile. Uh, secondly, th th this, this result is quite useful in, in 111 and, and statistical inference. And I'm not going to get into that much because I don't want to steal 111's thunder. But the, 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 the basic idea is simply that X may have some complicated or maybe even unknown distribution. And if we want to kind of like be testing a certain model or, th or things like that, it may be useful to, to, to be able to reduce things to uniform is just a very simple known standard distribution. And so it may be useful to reduce things to uniformity. And, we, and if we generate you know, a lot of instances of this and we find that they don't look uniform, then, may, then we conclude maybe there's something wrong with the model, that, that kind of thing. So it's, it's actually quite useful. But right now, I'm just thinking of it more of as a kind of conceptually neat thing. Uh, similarly, this one here, well, I just think that's a beautiful result because it says from a uniform, you know, you, you can get any, anything, which is pretty surprising. But it's also quite useful for, for simulation. So uh, just as an example of how to use this for, for simulation, let, let's use this, this distribution here, wh wh which, I, which I introduced over there. So let's consider that CDF. I'll just rewrite it. It's because it's easy. 1 minus e to the minus x for x positive. And that's called the exponential distribution with, with parameter 1, which will be an important distribution for later, but you don't have to know it right now. And suppose that we, we have access to a uniform between 0 and 1. And we're interested in, in simulating from this distribution. So we want to simulate x, which is distributed according to f. Well, all we have to do according, according to this result is compute the inverse of this function. So f inverse of u. Well, this is just, just like high, high school algebra of fi finding the inverse function, right? So if I set this thing equal to little u, and then this is u in terms of x, we just solve for x in, in terms of, of u, right? Then we would get minus log 1 minus u, just, just by taking the inverse function. OK, so, so, so the, therefore, the universality theorem immediately tells us that f inverse of capital U, which is minus log 1 minus capital U, has the desired distribution f. So if we were doing it on a computer and we wanted 10, 10 random draws from this distribution, we would just generate 10 IID uniforms, and then just compute this, just an easy function, compute this 10 times, and then we'd have 10 IID random draws from this distribution. So, so that's how it would, would be useful. Uh, while we're talking about this particular function, this is a good time to mention something about 1 minus u. Um, 1 minus u is also uniform 0, 1. So if we want to, we could have just done minus log of u rather than 1 minus u. That's an important uh, symmetry of, of the uniform. And you can check this easily for yourself. It's just you know, si simple good practice with, with CDFs and PDFs. But uh, in terms of a picture, if we're picking u is uniform between 0 and, and 1, let's, let's say it's there. So u is the distance from here to, to here, and it's uniform. And 1 minus u is from here to here, right? But there's a symmetry going on. It's like, why do we care whether we're measuring from the left to the right or from the right to the left? It doesn't matter. We just have a random point. OK, so that's the intuitive symmetry. But you, you, know, you should check the calculation, too. Uh, in general, that, that's going to be true that, that if we take a plus b u, where a and b are constants, and u is uniform between 0 and 1, so, 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 so then we're just doing linear stuff to it, that will be uniform still on, on some interval, whatever the appropriate interval is. So if we start with uniform 0, 1, and we want uniform 0 to 10, just, just multiply by 10. That's very straightforward. Um, but, in, but like an important common mistake to be aware of is that if we do, this is like a, is a linear transformation. If we do something nonlinear, then it's usually not going to be uniform anymore. Nonlinear usually leads to non-uniform.
For example, if we squared u, u, you can check that it will not be uniform anymore. And to, to check that, just compute the CDF. It doesn't look like the CDF of a uniform, so it's not uniform. So that's something to be careful of. You can't just say, well, u squared is between 0 and 1, so therefore it's uniform. You have to actually check it. In that case, if you check it, it's not true. OK? So, so that, that's, what, that, that's what, what this theorem is, is doing. It's just saying, in this direction, here's how we can simulate. And, and, in, and in this direction, it's saying, how do you go back from x to a uniform? OK, so you can kind of convert back and forth between distributions uh, th this way. All right, so let's, let's talk uh, a little more about in independence, just because I said that, that, sorry, these boards are very squeaky in this room. I said that I'd say something about independence, so, so let's say something about independence. We've talked already about independence of events, and I sent an email about this that I wanted uh, but I want to elaborate a little bit about what's, what's the difference between independence of random variables versus independence of events. So independence of random variables, they're closely related. We just define it directly in terms of independence of events. So if we have random variables x1 through xn, and we want to say what does it mean for these random variables to be independent, then the definition is that Definition is that they're independent um, if, if we look at the probability that x1 is less than or equal to little x1, blah, 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 xn less than or equal to little xn. So that's an event, right? It's, it's an intersection of, of n events. Okay? Now, intuitively, remember, in, independence intuitively means that to, to find the probability of an in intersection, we just have to multiply. So what this, what this means is that we can just multiply. Notice these are just the CDFs. So to, to compute this probability, we just need to multiply the separate CDFs. This thing here that I wrote down is called the joint CDF, because this is the CDF of all the random variables considered jointly as one probability thing. And here we've separated out just into the separate. These ones are card, called marginal. We'll, we'll come back to the, that in a later lecture. Um, but this, these are just the individual CDFs. Okay, and that has to be for all little x through little n. So actually, it looks simpler than the definition of independence of events. Because remember, for independence of events, if we want to say three events are independent, we talked about the fact that we have to have the triple intersection, but that's not enough, right? We also need all, all the pairwise ones. And here, I didn't bother writing any pairwise statements or three-way statements or whatever. I just have everything all in one. So it looks simpler, which, which seems strange at first. But the way to resolve that is that this is for all x1 through xn. So even though it looks simpler, actually, I've, I've written down uncountably many equations. And in, the, and in the case of just independence of events, it's a large list, but a finite list of equations. Here we have infinitely many e equations. It just looks like one equation, because you know, it's for all x1 through xn. All right, so, so that's the definition of independence in general. Uh, but in the discrete case, usually it's easier to work with PMFs rather than CDFs. And, and, and so then we work with what's called the joint PMF, where I'll, I'm just going to write the same equation again, except I'm going to replace less than or equal by equal. So that's just the product of the P PMFs. So this thing here is called the joint PMF. And, and in the discrete case, the, these two things are equivalent. Proving they're equivalent, it, there's nothing difficult about it. It's just a little bit tedious to write down because you just have to you know, write up the, the appropriate sums to, to convert between the, these things. Um, and it works out. And, and the intuition that it should work out should, should be very, very clear because what this is saying is, what this, this statement says is that knowing any, any collections, any subcollection of these x's, knowing their values, tells us nothing ab about 
the other ones, right? And this says the same thing. So, so, that's what it, in, so this is stronger than just pairwise independence. Pairwise independence would say if you know one of random variable, it doesn't tell you any information about any other one random variable. Full independence means no, knowing any of them, any collection of them tells you nothing about ones that, that, you, that you don't know. No information whatsoever. Uh, so so, that, so that, that's a stronger statement. And just to give you a quick example where um, pairwise independence doesn't imply independence, here's the simplest example I know of that. Let's just let x1 and x2 be uh, IID uh, coin flips, that is Bernoulli one half, fair coins. So if you want, just think of flipping a fair coin twice. And then this is kind of like a, an old game that people used to play called, called matching pennies, where you know, each person like, you know, pull, pulls out a penny and then see whether it's, it's the same or not. One person wins if they're the same, and the other, if they're both heads or both tails, and the other person wins otherwise. Uh, I think that used to be a popular game, but uh, not so popular anymore. However, that suggests, that suggests another random variable, which is a natural one to look at. That is, that is just, are they the same or not? So let's let x3 equal 1 if x1 equals x2 and 0 otherwise. So that's just saying 1 if, if, if the two pennies match, 0 otherwise. So that's an indicator random variable, right? So, OK. These, have, these uh, are pairwise independent, but not independent. It's obvious that they're not independent because if I know x1 and x2, I, I immediately know x3. x3 is a function of x1 and x2. So not only do, do, does, it, does it give me information, it gives me total information. So knowing x1 and x2 give us total information about x3. However, just knowing x1 tells us nothing about x2 because those I assumed are independent. Just knowing x1 tells us nothing about x3 because it's, it's still 50-50, right? If, if we know that x1 is 1, then this just reduces to saying x2 is, is 1 in order for this to be 1, but that's still 50-50. So similarly, x2 is independent of x3. So they're pairwise independent, but they're not independent. So I just said, I just said in words why that's true, but you, you can try you know, ch checking what, you know, what, what, what happens with these equations. What, why, why does that agree with that? So pairwise independence isn't enough in general. To, to have independence. All right. So um, the other thing we were doing last time w w was Lotus. And we are going to talk more about lo Lotus defin definitely on Wednesday. But I want to start on the normal distribution first, which is both important and also a, a, good, a good distribution to have on hand when we're doing more lo Lotus stuff. OK, so here's the normal distribution. Uh, it's also called the Gaussian. Uh, but, but I don't call it the Gaussian, because first of all, Gauss was you know, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. He has enough stuff named after him already. And secondly, he was not the first person to use this distribution. So it's not really fair to give him credit. So we call it the normal distribution. But I'm just mentioning that because you may see the, the term Gaussian, and it's the same thing. Uh, the normal distribution is by far the most famous, important distribution in, in all of statistics. And there are, there are many reasons for, for that. The, the most famous reason for that is, is, is what's called the uh, central limit theorem, which we're going to do towards the end of the semester. I'm just gonna, but I'm just going to tell you in words intuitively what it is now, just to kind of foreshadow it, just so you have a sense of why is this important. But then we'll, we'll go into the details of it much, much later in the course. Central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is, is possibly the most famous and important theorem in, in all of probability, so we're definitely going to talk about it later. It's kind of a very, very surprising result. What it says is if you add up a bunch of IID random variables, the distribution is going to look like a, a normal distribution. So this is, this is just one distribution 
or one family of distributions because you can also shift it and, and scale it. Aside from the shift and scale, it says that adding up a large number of IID random variables is always gonna, gonna look normal, which is kind of very, very shocking, I think, because it seems like, like, like I, didn't, I didn't say I was adding continuous random variables. They could be continuous, they could be discrete, they could be beautiful, they could be ugly, they could be anything. You add them up and it's always gonna look like the same shape. And that shape is one you've all seen before. It's just the standard bell-shaped bell curve. But you know, there are, there are different curves you could draw that look like bell curves, so what, why is this one particular bell-shaped curve comes up always as the only possibility? That's what this theorem says. So sum of a lot, I'll make this precise much later when, when we actually state it as a theorem and, and prove it, but just, just in, intuitively, sum of a lot of IID random variables looks normal. And by looks, I mean if you look at, if you look at what, what's the distribution, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be approximately a normal distribution. And there are even further generalizations of this uh, going beyond the IID case. You, you need some technical assumptions, but, but there, there are generalizations e even beyond this. Okay? So that's one reason that the normal is, 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 is so fundamental, and there, and there are others as well. Okay, so, so let's draw a little picture. So it's gonna look like, the, the, the PDF is just gonna look like this nice symmetrical bell shape curve, but, but there are many possible PDFs. So, so if, as long as this thing is, this is supposed to be symmetric, and it's more or less symmetric the way I drew it, but it's exactly symmetric. As long as the area is one, I mean, that, that, you know, there, there's millions of different possible PDFs that you could come up with that, that, that look basically like this. The normal is a specific one that's given by, let's start with what's called the standard normal, which is written as normal zero, one. This notation means that the mean is zero and the variance is one, but we'll, we'll, we'll prove that later. Okay, so the normal has two parameters, which are the mean and the variance. And we're going to start with the standard normal, which is mean zero, variance one. And let's write down its PDF. The PDF is um, f of z. It's kind of a, I w it's kind of a, a, a tradition of, of using the uh, le letter z, z for, for standard normals. Not, not that you have to do that, but, but off, often we'll use Z for standard normals. That's why I'm calling it Z rather than X. Um, so, well, it's going to be E to the minus Z squared over 2. If you plot this, this function just using, you know, your, your old calculus techniques, you know, find the derivative and the second derivative and the points of inflection and, and so on and plot this, or better yet, just using graphing calculator, you'll get something that looks like this. That's not yet a PDF, though, because it doesn't integrate to 1. So I'm just going to put some constant here, c, where c is whatever constant we need. That's called the normalizing constant. It's whatever constant we need such that the area will be 1. So you can, you can plot this thing, and you see it will look like this. That doesn't yet show what, why do we choose this. I mean, this is, you know, it's a nice looking fu function, right? We can see that it's symmetrical because if we replace z by minus z, nothing happens. We can see that it will, it will go to zero very, very fast because, you know, exponential decay is already fast and here it's being squared up in the exponent. So, so it's going to decay to zero very, very fast as, as, as z gets very positive or very negative. Uh, so, you know, it's a nice enough looking function, but it will be much later when we see why this, this is the most important PDF. Right now it's just a PDF with, with an unknown normalizing constant, okay? So before we can get much further with this, uh, it would be useful to, to know the value of C. So let's, let's try to get the normalizing constant. Uh, so that might be a long calculation. So I'll try to do that over here. So we, we need to know in order to make this integrate to 1, we just need to integrate the, the, this function. So let's try to do this integral. We want to know the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus z squared over 2 
dz. Okay, so that's actually a famous integral in, in, in mathematics, partly because of probability and statistics, but partly just in its own right. This seems like, you know, seems like something we should be able to integrate. So of, of course you can try doing, you know, like a u substitution or some other kind of change of variables. It, it will not work. You could try doing integration by parts, and you know there's many ways to try integration by parts, right? You can try to split it up in, in some way. It will not work. Uh, try a anything else you could ever think of, just, just for, let's say we want to find an antiderivative and then use the fundamental theorem of calculus, the usual way we do integrals. I can guarantee you that, that they won't work. The reason is that there is actually a, a theorem that says that this integral, as an indefinite integral, that is, without the limits of integration, is impossible to do it in closed form. And, and it's kind of pretty amazing, I think, that, that someone was able to prove that, right? It's not just like no one has thought of a way to do it. Someone proved that you, you can't ever do it, so, so don't even try. And what I mean by, well, to, to qualify that a bit, there is one way we could do this integral that will work, and that, that is the definite integral. That is, that's e to a power, remember? So, so we've been using the Taylor series for e to a power over and over again. That series converges everywhere, okay? So if we want, we could just expand this out as a Taylor series, and, that's, and the way to do that would not be to start taking derivatives of this. It would be to take the Taylor series for e to the x and then, and then plug in x is minus e squared over two. We'll, we'll get an infinite series, and then you know, with, 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 with some analysis, you, you, you can justify integrating that term by term, that, that is, that is, we replace this by an infinite sum and then integrate each term. And those are all very, very easy integrals because that's just, you know, polynomial stuff. Uh, but then we just get this infinite series and we wouldn't know what, what, what to do with it, okay? So when I say this integral is impossible, it means that it's impossible to do it in closed form, that is just as a finite sum, in terms of what are called elementary functions. By elementary, we mean just the familiar functions, you know, sine and cosine and exponential and log and, and you know, polynomials and stuff, and anything you can write down in terms of standard functions, you can't do. Okay, so, so this is impossible as a definite integral, as an indefinite integral, but that doesn't rule out all hope that we could do the definite integral, right? That is, we might be able to find the area under the curve without first finding an antiderivative. We will not be able to find an antiderivative in closed form because it's impossible, okay? But we can try to find the area. All right, so how do we find the the area under the curve, uh, you know, so we have this, this function here, which looks kind of like that, and we want to know this area from minus infinity to infinity. And so we write down this integral, and we can't find an antiderivative. And at, at this point, uh, if, I, if I didn't already know how to do this, I, I would probably be, be stuck, because it seems very difficult. The, the way we're used to doing this would be find an antiderivative, right? So we're kind of basically stuck at this point. Um, so someone, and I, w I wish I knew who, someone came up with, with, with a, like incredibly stupid and incredibly brilliant way to solve this integral. Which is to, this, this, this method does not usually work. But in this problem it does. And that method is we have this problem that we can't do, so we write it down a second time. And that solution may just look like kind of like banging your head against the wall, that you can't do the integral, so you keep writing it down over and over again. That doesn't seem like it would help the situation. Actually, this solves the whole problem. So, so let me show you why the, this, this trick of just writing down the same thing twice solves the, the, this problem. Well, let, let, let's just change the notation a little bit. This letter z here is, is, is what's called a dummy variable, right? You can change x to, to whatever you want. This is just notation for area under the curve. So just, so just so that I can keep track of this is my first integral I can't do, and this is my second identical integral I can't do, I'm going to change the notation to x and y so I can tell them apart. So this is e to the minus x squared over 2 dx, and this is integral e to the minus y squared over 2 dy. It's the exact same thing. Now, let's write this as one integral, 
So this is a, a double integral, but if you haven't dealt with double integrals much, as I said on the first day of class, it's nothing to worry about. You just do two single integrals, one after the other. So this can also be written as the double integral of e to the minus x squared plus y squared over 2 dx dy, where the interpretation of this double integral is that first we do the inner integral, keep keeping y held constant, and then do the outer integral. That's the exact same thing because if you imagine rewriting this as a product again, it, when we're doing this inner integral, we're holding y constant so we can just pull that out. And then, and then what we have left here is just one of these integrals. You can pull that integral out. It's the exact same thing. So, uh, so I've written it as a double integral. Well, it still doesn't look so much easier, uh, but then there's one, 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 one thing that is saving us here as the fact that we have this x squared plus y squared. Whenever you see an x squared plus y squared, it should remind you of the Pythagorean theorem, right? Sums of, uh, sums of squares. So we draw a simple little picture. Let's say, suppose x, y is up here, just for simplicity. Of course, it could be in any quadrant. So here's x, here's y. And, and if we let r squared equal x squared plus y squared, I'm using the letter r for radius. That is, it, that is, it's the distance from here to here, right? Just the, the distance formula, just basic geometry. And there's some angle theta. The fact that we have r squared sitting right there is a hint that it may be useful to convert to polar coordinates. So polar coordinates just says represent points in terms of a, a, a radius and an angle rather than in terms of the Cartesian coordinates of, you know, x and y. Okay, so we're going to convert from x, y to r theta, that is polar coordinates. So our limits of integration are, are going to change. Uh, so first of all, what is that thing? That's just e to the minus r squared over 2, and we're going to integrate as dr d theta. We could also do d theta dr. Now theta is this angle, so that's going to go from 0 to 2 pi. And r is, th is this length, so r goes from 0 to infinity. And then there's one other thing we, we need here, which, it, which, it, which is so something that, you know, one of the very few facts from multivariable calculus that we need in, the, in this course is, is what happens when you transform in, you know, in more than one dimension. You, you need to multiply by, by, by something here called the Jacobian. And I discussed this on the math review uh, handout. So if you're not familiar with this, you, you, you can re review that handout. And I actually do this particular case of this, this transformation because this is a very common transformation, convert to polar coordinates. OK, so if we do that, what the, the Jacobian here works out to r. That, that's, just a, that's just a little calculation. If you haven't seen it before, then you, know, you can read about it in the math review handout or in a calculus book. So that's called the Jacobian. So we, can, we don't just replace dx dy by dr d theta, we replace it by r dr d theta is the correct way to do it. That is what, is what now makes this from, be, go from being a very hard problem to a very easy problem. As soon as we have the r here, then that, that just suggests, well, well look, if we, the derivative of r squared is 2r, so we have kind of the derivative si sitting right, right here. The derivative of what's up in the exponent is just sitting right there. Now it's just an e easy substitution in integral. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of, now let's, let's just do this in, inner integral, and then we have a d theta at the end. So just doing this inner integral, let's just let u equal r squared over 2. So du equals r dr. OK. So r dr is what we have there, so that's just the integral of 0 to infinity e to the minus u du. Now that's a really easy integral. Integral of e to the minus u is minus e to the minus u. So, so this integral is just 1. So what, what are we doing? We're integrating 1 from 0 to 2 pi. That's 2 pi. And lastly, we just notice, well, that's not the integral we started with. That's the square of the integral we started with. So therefore, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus z squared over 2 
dz. Since we wrote it down twice, we got 2 pi. If we had written it down once, we'd get the square root of 2 pi. So, that, so that's what we need for the normalizing constant. All right. So now we know what this c is. c equals 1 over square root of 2 pi. Kind of amazing, first of all, that this trick worked. And secondly, we're integrating an exponential, and suddenly we get square root of pi. Where, where did the pi come from? Where, where did the circle come from? Pi makes you think of circles. Where did the circle come from? Well, the circle came from the fact that we were using polar coordinates. So, so suddenly the pi appears. All right, so, so that's nice. Now, now we know the normalizing constant. So that's, that's the standard normal distribution. Let's, co let's compute it, its mean and variance, and then we can talk a little bit about the general normal as opposed to the standard normal. Okay, so that's the standard normal. Let's, let's, let's compute its mean and variance. I've already claimed that the mean is zero and the variance is one, but we haven't checked that yet. So let, 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 let's, let's verify that, okay? So first of all, let's get the mean. The mean is easy. Uh, so, so we're gonna let z be standard normal, and sorry for the pun, we're gonna compute ez, which I said is easy. Why is it easy? It's, e it's easy because of symmetry. By definition, the mean is the expected value of z times the PDF, which we now know is 1 over square root of 2 pi, which I can take out because that's a constant, e to the minus z squared over 2 dz equals 0. That was an easy integral. Why is it 0? Well, I just said it's by symmetry. And the general type of symmetry we're, we're, we're using here is that if we have an odd function, uh, let's say g of, just, just as a general statement, if g of x is, is an odd function, which I'll remind you means that it has the symmetry property that g of minus x equals minus g of x, that's the definition of an odd function. An even function would be if we did not have a minus sign here. That's the definition of an odd function. Then if we integrate g symmetrically, let's say from minus a to a, where that's the same, you know, uh, from minus a to a, not from just any a to b, of course, we'll always get zero. And, and, you know, you can do that by splitting this up into two integrals and check that, but the easiest way to see that is, is just like, you know, a, as an example, you know, like for example, sine is, is an odd function, and if you had something that looks like that, where, where this is symmetrical and you say you integrate from like there to there, then the negative area cancels out the positive area, and so it, it, it's true. Or you can verify it by splitting it up into two integrals. The positive area cancels the negative area. Well, this is an odd function, right? Because if I replace z by minus, th this thing I'm integrating is, is an odd function. So if I replace z by minus z, nothing happens to the exponential part, and that becomes minus z. So it's an odd function. So just by symmetry, you can immediately say 0 without having to do some nasty calculation. All right, so that's good. Uh, but let's try to get the variance. Variance is, is going to take a little more work. So the variance of z is e of z squared minus e of z squared the other way. But that second part we just showed is, is 0, so that's just e of z squared. So now is where we're st starting to need lotus again. So I'll, I'll remind you. We haven't proven lo lotus yet, but we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Here I just want to show how to use it. Lotus says that if we want e of z squared, we do not first need to find the PDF of z squared. We can directly work it in terms of the PDF of z. That's what we talked about last time. So we know immediately that this is just the integral. I'll take out the 1 over square root 2 pi again. Integral minus infinity to infinity z squared e to the minus z squared over 2 dz. So it was exactly the same integral, except I replaced z by z squared. That's why it's called the law of the unconscious statistician, because that's just kind of an obvious thing to do, just plug in z squared. Lotus says that that is, a, is, is in fact, valid. 
OK, so now we just have to do this integral. This integral, um, this is now an, an even function, which is nice, but not as nice as having an odd function. So with an even function, um, if we want, we can integrate from 0 to infinity instead. And I think I'd rather do that. It's not necessary to convert it this way, but I'd rather integrate from 0 to infinity just so that I can avoid thinking about negative numbers for a while. But let's go from 0 to infinity and multiply by 2. Since it's an even function, that's perfectly correct, because we have a positive area, positive area, and so it's just twice. But by symmetry, it's the same thing twice. So, so just twice the area from 0 to infinity of the same thing. Uh, z squared e to the minus z squared over 2 dz. Now here, uh, I think we need to resort to integration by parts, which usually I try to avoid. But once in a while, we can't avoid it. This integral, uh, so, so just in terms of the strategy for using integration by parts, remember with your integration by parts, you need to split the, 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 the integrand into two pieces one piece that's easy to integrate and one piece that's easy to differentiate. Now, z squared is easy to do whatever we want with. The part we should focus on is, th is this thing. And we don't know how to in integrate that. Uh, we know how to integrate it from minus infinity to infinity, but we don't know how to integrate it in, gen in general over, over some interval. Um, but we saw you know, over in this calculation we just did that if, if there were an extra z here, then it's a really easy integral. So we're going to split this z squared into two z's, zz, there, OK? Now we're in good shape, because this thing, we could let this thing be u and this thing be dv, right? Because, because that's something we know how to integrate. So in other words, we're letting u equal z, so du equals dz. That's really simple. And we're letting dv equal z e to the minus z squared over 2. So v equals e to the minus z squared over 2. And to check that, if we take the derivative of this, um, there should be a minus sign in front. If we take the derivative of this by the chain rule, we get that, right? So OK. So therefore, now we're in good shape to, to do integration by parts. So this is just you know your usual integration by parts thing. It's, it's 2 over root 2 pi times, and then you know we do uv integrated from uh, 0 to, uh, evaluated from, from 0 to infinity, and then, and then minus the integral of v du, but that's minus a minus because of that. So we're going to do minus, minus is plus the integral of e to the minus z squared over 2 dz from 0 to infinity. OK, now we're actually done with this calculation, because all we have to do is say, that's, just the, that's the integral we just did. The only difference is that we're going from 0 to infinity instead of minus infinity to infinity. Oh, this part is just 0. Because if you look at what, what is this, near 0, this part is, is 0, and this part is, is like, uh, close to 1, so, so, uh, or close to negative 1. And, 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 and um, when z is very large, then this, this part's exponentially small. So this part is just 0. So we only have to concentrate on this part. But that's what we just did. This is 1 half of the integral that we just computed, right? So, so it, it, it's 1 half of square root of 2 pi. When we multiply 1 half square root of 2 pi by this, we get 1. So, so this whole thing just becomes 1, because it's just this times its reciprocal. So, so what this showed was that the variance is equal to, to, to 1, which, which, which is what I said here. So that's good. All right, well, uh, so, so a couple more very quick things about the normal, and then we'll continue next time. Uh, just, just for an important piece of notation, this is standard notation in statistics. The notation is, is, that, is, is for the CDF. Capital Phi is the standard normal CDF. Because this distribution is so important and yet so hard to deal with in the sense that 
you know, it was a lot of work to do that integral, now it's going from minus infinity to infinity, then it deserves its own name. So in other words, phi of z equals 1 over root 2 pi times the integral from minus infinity up to z of e to the minus t squared over 2 dt. I just changed the letter to t to avoid clashing with the z here. So that's just the CDF, right? Because this function is so important, that this, this CDF is very easy to calculate, you know, using various computer or cal calculators, very easy to find tables of this. So in a sense, we got around the problem that we couldn't do this integral by just saying call this phi of z and now just treat that as a standard function. And now we can do this integral, it's just capital phi. Right, so, so that, that, that's standard notation for that. And one other remark about that is what happens if we get phi of minus z? This is something you should check for yourself. Phi of minus z equals one minus phi of z by symmetry. And just for practice in the concept of symmetry and CDFs, you should check, check this for yourself. Just draw a picture and see why, why that's true. It's a useful fact. All right, so next time we'll continue with the non-standard normal. That's the standard normal.